Hey, everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Luke. Hello. Hello. Good morning. It's, it's, um, uh, it's good to see you, my old friend. We go way back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, way back as of last week. A week, a week. Yeah. yeah, I know. Um, yeah, that's, well, see, that's what you get from uh, failing to hit record is, uh, you know, like, I know so much about you already. I feel like, you know. Yeah. Hey, hey yeah. I've got, I have long-term like online professional relationships with people where I've only seen their Twitter profile pic. So yeah. the fact that we've actually talked. I know it's a bit, yeah. And, and the the thing is, it's kind of like we've had Microsoft build in between our talk. So oh, yeah. even, even a week, a lot changes in the technology uh, world. Well, so We should get into that as well. But for folks that don't know who you are, who are you? Where are you? What do you do? Um, so my name is Luke Murray. I'm a technical consultant at um, in Hamilton, New Zealand. Um, so my role is essentially pre-sales, so technical pre-sales, solution architecture, taking business requirements for small, medium businesses around the Hamilton, Waikato area um, of the North Island. Yes like estimating projects to move them to the cloud, Microsoft Azure, um, modernize and look at, you know, some, some of their cost optimization and, and operational processes to make things better. Um, well, and you also like, I always like to point it out every time I talk to somebody in New Zealand, you live in one of my favorite places in the world. Mm. For folks, if you've not visited New Zealand, I mean, I'm, I'm a total Lord of the Rings nerd oh, yes, any, yeah. anyway. Um, but uh, in fact, I was in Wellington the day before they, the Weta workshop announced that they were doing the Hobbit movies and the dates uh, and all that stuff. So yeah. I was actually in there the day prior and there was a lot of activity going on. And we tried, buddy and mine and I tried to kind of sneak around the gate. If you've been down there, it's pretty secure. Mm -hmm. And they were starting on some projects for what turned out to be the the Hobbit, and so that's why security was yeah. tighter than normal. But yeah, anyway. it's pretty pretty awesome to go down there and see what they've done and some of the models, and definitely a place you could spend a lot of money at. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But it's a, uh, no, it's a, it's a beautiful country. I've actually, I did the uh, Tongariro Crossing with a buddy of mine. So that's, the, oh, yes. there's actually two mountains, the two volcanoes that were used for parts of it for filming the uh, um, uh, uh, Mount Doom scenes and things. Yeah. I think where the initial battle was and the kind of the precursor with Elrond and, and, and such going on and fighting against... Um, you saw on in the beginning, the opening scenes, you way back probably, time machine. You've probably seen more of New Zealand than I have. <laughs> well, I, just, I actually, I, it, when I was my first time driving on the other side of the road too, I was alone down the South Island yeah. and I was driving along and I'm looking around again, this is how much of a nerd I am though. And I'm mm. driving along and I go an area like, this just looks like Rohan. It just looks like it. Yeah. And, and so I kind of pulled off and was eating some lunch or something. Um, and it's why I remember this so distinctly, but I was looking up on my phone and they actually had the, the road marker of where it was like where I thought it looked like Rohan was where they filmed actually the where, like yeah. right there. And yeah. uh, it was cool. Uh, the, it, why I remember that so distinctively is because it was at that point that I then entered the highway mm -hmm. on the incorrect side of the highway. I was doing the old American thing yep. and almost hit somebody, scared me to death, and I did not make that mistake the rest of the trip. Yeah, uh, we've had the opposite, well, the same experience, but in the States. Because, yeah, yeah um, I think I told you last week, but for the audience, I've been to the States a couple of times. I actually got married in Vegas and the first trip 
that we did to the States was LA for three days, then New York, because that's always been a dream of mine. So I ended up at New York on my birthday. This was, you know, five, five or so years ago. And then back to LA again for, for a couple of days. But we we Ubered, took shuttles, got flights the first time around. But the second time around, which was three, you know, three years ago, really good timing before the pandemic hit. Um, we went to the States and that's when we got married in the October of, you know, mm -hmm. that year. But we made the decision to get a rental car. So we flew in, got a shuttle to the rental car place, all good. And they just, so there was three of us there. So myself, my wife and stepson and uh, you know, some some luggage, but they decided to upgrade us to like a seven seater big Nissan Ute, definitely American. So you had a big boat. So yeah, we essentially right. had a yeah. had a big boat. So here we were trying to drive on the other side of the road for the very first time in this massive car from yep. um from LA to Vegas and let's just say once we got to Vegas we just Ubered everywhere because we just didn't want to take you know yeah. it's just I had the to stress say, and it. that makes a difference too because for me you know driving on the left side of the road um I was to your point I was so grateful that I had this tiny little car so I had more visibility I was more aware of where I was mm. My my next time I was driving in Scotland and it was up in the Highlands and where the roads get narrow and a lot of times single lane and you have to navigate if there's opposite traffic coming. Yep. But I found myself, you know, like drifting too far to the left. I, you know, hit, scraping up against the curb occasionally on that side. So, you know, not having the visibility of doing a giant car, like I completely understand that issue. Yeah, well, well we coming from New Zealand where the majority of our cars are small compared to what this you know small sedan sedans versus what the you know what you we saw in the states anyway we we're thought all in oh, suvs all SUVs. Just, we're in a yeah. big car they'll get out of the way but nah they're all big cars <laughs> so now, it's really the yep one of my favorite this, stories and, just kind of on this point and then we'll move on but mm -hmm. my brother-in-law served in the military in the 80s uh, in germany he was stationed in germany and one of his uh, um, platoon mates, whatever, um, I, I guess apparently you could pay 500 bucks and have any car from America shipped over to you because they were there for years. Yep. Had a Bigfoot truck, the Texan with a massive truck jacked up. And uh, so my brother-in-law telling stories how they would go cruise around and people would just see them coming and move off both directions if they see them in the rearview mirror or up you know even if there's plenty of room they would just move yeah. out of the way and just ha have that space it's a i would have loved to have had that vehicle uh up on the scottish highlands or on down the south island some of those those areas but mm. anyway well let's move on so you're watching bill you're, you're participating in build you're watching consuming content consuming content watching yep and Any major just, takeaways? Uh, yeah, I think there's a couple of exciting. So Azure Container Apps is now GA, which is really exciting. Um, definitely going to be looking at, you know, new customer scenarios to use that technology. Um, Azure Dev, the Dev Box stuff. So being mm -hmm. able to just go and stand up a VM running Visual Studio Code, um, you know, latest PowerShell version, for example, all, yep. you know, all those binaries, really, really useful. Because I know for me personally, I stand up the Azure VM for testing or, you know, it might be running an Azure DevOps agent. I delete it. Yeah. A month, a month later, I go and do the exact same thing. Um, create the VM and you know, and then do what I need to do, then delete it just to save on my um, Visual Studio Enterprise costings. But, right. you know, the smart the smart idea would be shared image, you know, do an image gallery, stuff like that. But the Azure Dev, Dev Box, 
um, I see getting really useful not only for production scenarios or businesses where a developer might come in to do a certain project or a contractor and then they might leave but not only but for us um, in IT being able to stand up uh, environment in another company subscription that has all the controls with conditional access and stuff that the company offers but and then it's just deleted afterwards and yeah I think the technology's been there with Azure Virtual Desktop and just pay-as-you-go IaaS machines and image, being able to create custom images for a while, but seeing it bundled into like a Azure Dev Labs kind of service is kind of, um, it's pretty cool to see. So I, I expect that will be used quite. Yeah, that that's... Um... Uh, again, not be not being a dev in, in that space, mm. but um, having helped manage Hyper B environments, Hyper View environments for years, um, and that was uh, leaps and bounds. There were third party vendors that had similar stand up, you know, demo uh, environments or demo, not demo, um, but um, uh, you know, um, but uh, you know, quick environments that you could kind of configure the different components and things around there, but have Microsoft actually run it and out in Azure. And the fact that it's great that you want to stand something up, build something, test something out, then delete it, remove it, you know, reset it, but that you can um, take a snapshot, easily stand up a similar environment, yeah. or you decide, hey, you know, actually we want to, we like this, we like this third party, we're going to buy the other licensing for it, and you just move it over into production. Or and and to keep it in place, it's really exciting that they did that. I mean, I I've used Microsoft's demo.microsoft.com and demo mm. environments frequently, and it used to be like it was thirty days, and then you're done. That's it. You could, and then they changed that the where you could uh, with permission extend that demo environment, and yeah. then they added later the ability to well now you can promote that and use it for production. You can pay for it. Like, I want to keep this demo environment. I like what I've built. Um, so yeah, it, I, I, w I would probably never do that because I like mucking around and breaking things. <laughs> so, so my de demo environments in production would be probably. <laughs> right. I, well, that, but well, that's a whole other discussion. You yeah. can, then there's should you. Yeah. Should you, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's why they pay us the big bucks in IT, right? Apparently. Right. <laughs> but that whole um, concept, I mean, it, it, mm. again, coming from the SharePoint world, um, there was a big push and we used to refer to it. I was at Microsoft back in the, you know, before the 2007 release and, and there for 2010 with Sandbox Solutions. And we used yeah. to refer to it as what we want is like a sandbox that we can go and play. And then they, of course, name it that. Um, I was in a team that was a spinoff of Microsoft IT, which became... MMS, which became BPOS, which is now Office 365. So it was there at the, you know, the beginning of that. Um, yep. But that was, you know, that's actually the language we would use. Like we want to create an environment where people could go in and experiment, have all of the configurations of the organization, but try things out without breaking everything. So not production. Yep. That was back in the day when most people, again, the SharePoint world, um, if they were um, testing things out, it was usually uh, on production. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your, yeah. I, I think like the technology has changed, but the people process has changed as well. Like um, five years ago, you were still, you know, well, it's just been out 13 years, years now, and it's come a long way in, in that space, but having the technology is one thing, but you need the people and the processes to align. So you've gone from massive waterfall projects where everything needs, you know, you spend X amount of time on the requirements gathering, making sure you're spending a lot more time very early on. And that's not to say that you shouldn't do that. You should definitely like discovery phase of a project is is ideal to be successful, but um, with methodologies like agile, you know, being being a bit more, having a bit more agility yep. allows you to go, oh, we want to try something, but we don't know if it's going to work. 
hey, let's just stand up a POC. Yeah. Shut so it down, delete it afterwards. We have our learnings. This is, you know, it's 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 become a lot more consumable where, it, yeah, you're trialing stuff a lot earlier in the piece than doing all the theoretical stuff and then hoping it all fits together at the end. Well, having those, you know, uh, yeah, shorter list of requirements or outcomes, you know, being able to go in and iterate on that, take those learnings, mm-hmm. fold it in or fail quickly and then go try something else around that. We're more aligned with doing that. Do you still run into a lot of customers that are more of the old fashioned, the waterfall, the longer projects? Are you, yeah, are and, you and still it, fighting those battles? Yeah, and it's primarily because of the space that I operate in. Like I, so I work for a MSP. So we like a managed service provider. Mm-hmm. So we provide, we do projects for external customers. Um, like stand up or migrate to Azure or or migrate to M365, for example. So those those type of projects, we do statement of work. It's more aligned to an agile methodology Mm -hmm. Um, where previous organizations I've worked at the whole, right, what's your sprint cycle? So, you know, two week sprint, we're going to get this done. It's going to be, right, let's just improve. So there's a lot more... you can do a lot more continuous delivery when you're in the environment working 24 seven, or you've got, you know, a custom app that you're building, for example, but the way that I work currently um, because of the nature of our business is the clients want to move from an on-premise file server or exchange environment into M365 we do the statement of work. We have a waterfall-based plan. You know, it's going to be done in six weeks, as an example. Yeah. Done, and then we'll look at the roadmap and continuous improvement exercises to go. What else? Like you've got the technology now. Let's improve it. But it's yeah, the, the projects are more. This is the outcome we want to deliver, and by when? It's not as much of a. But it's. Yeah, they're like, they're a bit more longer pieces of work than like a two week two week sprint. So it's a bit right. it's a bit hard to sort of use that methodology without, you know, going out of scope of something that we haven't signed off. Or yeah, it's yeah, interesting so, thinking about that. I like I I look back at my career. Like I I talk about you know early in my career as a technical project manager. My I had an eighteen month project. I did other smaller projects. But thinking about like how I would break that up uh, and, and like to your point, it, like it, it wouldn't really fit. The, the goal, there, there were long lead items as part of this. We were doing data center consolidation. And I, I mean, I guess technically you could break it up into smaller projects. Like one component of that, there were, there were four data centers involved. We were removing all of our systems from two, some of our systems from a third, consolidating to a brand new fourth Mm. data center and so there were you could treat each of those systems as a project or each of those locations as as a project um you know but you know overall what you know i was measured on was that end-to-end 18-month process not on the smaller pieces but yeah I, i guess um we could have a longer conversation around kind of oh, technical yeah. project management methodology and for sure and changes it's, that yeah. are happening around there. <laughs> I could spend hours, on. Yeah, yeah, hours on this, but yeah. Well, I still find it fascinating. It's funny. I mean, I've been around uh, away from project management type functions, but I'm still really grateful to have had that experience. Like I never got PMP certified. I had a lot as a, as a manager. Uh, I paid for a lot of my direct reports to go through and get their PMP yep. certification, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm a believer in there. I look at it, I got my MBA. That was project management enough. I, I don't need to go do something more around that. Mm, but it's enough. a. Yep. But I'm so grateful that I had that training early on in my career because I've been able to utilize it in other roles throughout my career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely uh, um, project management or whether it's agile or waterfall or, you know, whether using Kanban or, you know, another methodology or process or, you know, way of displaying the data, it 
it's all valuable and you can use it else elsewhere you know yeah. it's just it's a it's, function of steps to achieve an outcome at right. the end of the day I, um, I would always tell people like i don't care what your methodology is as long as you utilize one you know use what yes. makes sense yep. but follow something that's structured that'll move you through and and yep. follow that progress that, that everyone is following at right. the same yeah yeah the same process so in theory yes <laughs> <laughs> well that there is that see right there that's the adventure of project management is because there's always one or more people that aren't following that process and and that's where um the the soft skills come into play of yep yeah there's, there's I, a... I really want to hurt that person that is not following the project plan how can i do this legally and without <laughs> hr getting involved yeah <laughs> yeah or, or the police yeah 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 or the police you know yeah um there's a certain level of uh uh you know violent shaking that you can do to another adult before the authorities have to get involved i think that's okay so yeah uh, another another product that microsoft released during build that sounds really interesting as well is you know it's go, it's going on the same thing as the azure dev box it's the azure deployment environment so having a self-service web portal being able to you know select what you want like you might want a web app with a sql backend being able to select that and then have the azure infrastructure as code or bicep templates kick that off and then create them i think it's definitely a filling a gap that we've been missing especially around platform teams so it's going to be really interesting to look at that closer um, and get get access and see what we can break with that because being able to go here's your self-service portal do whatever you want click on a button have your sql app configured to the way that we have it as a standard um not only with the arm templates but you know relying on azure policy as well to force that but no public IPs exist in a subscription, as an example. RDP is an open um, TLS 1.2 and above is used on storage accounts. I, I think it's going to be really interesting to look at that um, and see where you know where that leads us. Well, I, I I know that you know Microsoft has really been trying to build out their you know infrastructure and platform as a service capabilities so that developers, engineers, you know, entrepreneurs can focus on going and building things, trying things and not getting stuck in standing up environments and making sure the right pieces are there to be able to even start then creating something. So, I mean, this is an area that competitively, I think like Amazon's been doing, you know, really well for a long time, but this is one of the reasons why Azure's cap catching up very quickly. I still don't know where it is. I don't know how far Microsoft is from Amazon, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm not too getting, sure getting close. Yeah. But uh, well, very cool. So well, one last thing before, before we go, I, I, you know, so you had shared last week, but have you share again, kind of, so what was your path to becoming an MVP? Like, what did you have to go through? What were the, the steps? People are always interested to, uh, to know and compare and contrast their own lives and their own desires to become an MVP. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. So, as as in like i when i was 14 years ago just starting um college in like in new zealand the the equivalent so i started doing volunteer work at a local computer shop mm -hmm. um essentially after school during school holidays fixing computers by that by that time it was windows 95 days mm -hmm. um helping out there. Then I end up finishing college, getting a full-time job there where I spent another X amount of uh, years. But early on during, I think it was early 2000s, there was a movie. Um, and ironically enough, that movie was called Antitrust and it was about open source. So at that stage, it was definitely very much you know playing around with linux and all sorts of other things but there was a saying in that movie human knowledge belongs to the world 
and it's always stayed with me mm -hmm. um and and so that triggered me to start blogging putting in fixes that i found all sorts of other things um so i started a website i started blogging i started putting stuff up to even to this day articles that i wrote back then are there it, it helped teach me about technical writing um it was only really at that stage it was only really for myself to go back and have a look at what what things happened but then over time as i changed roles moved across different industries the it was a way of me learning publicly and helping to give back to mm -hmm. the community so people didn't run into the same problems that i did for example yeah. or or i could go this is how i've done it someone else may have different experiences different ways of working and then try and get their their comments so i th i believe i never set out to become an mvp as a goal um because to be fit, to be honest i never thought i would achieve it some you know nerdy guy in a rural town in um new zealand just it was it was a goal that never occurred to me mm -hmm. um and so i like i've always had a passion for technology i've brought up i've been brought up alongside microsoft technologies um you know windows server windows desktop um all sorts of other things and so there was a there was a stage in my career that it was I was a senior system engineer and looking out at all the jobs and the, the shifts started to change from managing an on-premise environment into, oh, you need these cloud skills, Azure. Um, it wasn't at the DevOps stage yet. It was more along the lines of, you need to know how to stand up an ISVM or, you know, or, or something like that. So. I realized at that point that the environment that I was working in was very much still old school on premises and there was no due to data regulation and, and other things. There was really no foreseeable roadmap to move to the cloud. Mm -hmm. So I, I made a step to leave and that was probably the best thing I ever did for my career because I suddenly got thrust into the cloud Azure world um, and I loved it. The continuous change of technology, the different way of working, like we talked earlier about mm -hmm. waterfall and agile methodology. So that agile was sort of starting to come through around the same time to, you know, in, in these organizations. So yeah, for me, it was kind of, I, I wanted to learn more, so I started to go write what what do I need to learn? Started to write more articles, fleshed out my technical writing a bit more. Uh, as part of the learning process, um, I helped, like I help out on the Microsoft Tech community yep. and the for Q and A forums where where I can as well because there's a whole lot of write like. Azure is such a huge platform. It's a huge category. Well, that's ecosystem. why I always ask like people like at, you're an Azure MVP, but it's yep. so broad that can, there's so many things within that. I'm like, look, I'm part of the largest segment of MVPs. I believe, you know, I'm in office apps and services, which is again, all of those workloads. Yep. And so you always have to ask, well, what do you, what do you specialize within that area? So in, in Azure specifically. Yeah. So yeah, like, it's it is uh it's almost like a sand pit full of a whole lot of Lego blocks and or you know being able to just pick up and build whatever you want. Um, so yeah, the the way the work that I had and the type of uh, environments that I operated in, it, you know, I I came through in the more the compute space, the networking, you know the infrastructure as code perspectives versus um a dev so i'm i've definitely come up with more of an it professional focus than yeah. 
than a dev focus, but the the world's changed where actually they're like it's my belief that they're one and the same now. Um, yeah. you still got your you still got your operational people because things still need to run, whether in the cloud or not. But the you know, bit, I started to learn things like being able to deploy pipelines with Azure DevOps and and things like that. I'm definitely no expert, but yeah. That's Those. a good, that's a, that's a great area to go and build mm. expertise around. I spent yeah. a number of years, um, you're probably not familiar with the company, but I, uh, uh, but in the software configuration management space and my interest in, in SCM as a category. And I worked with a company called rational software. They got bought by IBM, but this is so wow, 23, 24 years ago, mm. uh, I ended up selling my company, my startup that I co-founded too rational. Um, but, uh, you know, learning about SCM and, uh, you know, code management, we actually ended up using ClearCase as a product as the engine for a, an information management and project management solution. So we actually morphed it and did other things with it. Um, nice. But it's, but that's one of those areas, again, we can get back and we can talk project management and technical project yeah, management yeah. for a long yep. time. Um, but it's another area, I guess part of my point is that there are so many different areas in and around this. If you're interested in learning more about Azure, um, learning more about, you know, uh, like all the different aspects uh, within Azure, um, even as a business person, I, my, I have marketing degrees, um, but I've been in tech my entire career, going and learning about this stuff. And there are product companies, there are service companies, MSPs and things that are out there mm -hmm. that need marketing people with the basic understanding of the technology to be able to go and better serve their, their needs. Project managers, analysts, technical writers, I mean, non-technical yeah. functions in support of all of these different roles. There's just so yeah. much growth, so much opportunity. There is, and um, New Zealand, because so so New Zealand doesn't have like a, I mentioned very briefly about the data res residency um, issues at a previous organisation I worked at. New Zealand doesn't have uh, Azure region yet, so we're leveraging Australia, like the Australia East and Southeast regions, for our services. So there is a New Zealand region coming which i'm really excited about and and another thing i thought would never happen um so which which is going to help grow drive the growth um in this market as well and because because there's a lot of companies still used to capex paying like they'll, they'll yeah. pay for something um like a new host or san they'll put it in for three to five years and then they'll sit on it yeah. Um, during during that period, security holes, patching, and then um, if they see any real growth, then they struggle that they hit those capacity issues very quickly. So yeah, yeah that that elasticity of the cloud is one of the most compelling stories of the value of that. And, and that's that's one of the reasons why I like it so much because it is almost my uh, well you know it's everyone's own little mini data center and a, yeah. at a you know a pane of glass and being able to create things with scripts and all sorts of other things the, the like the world in it has changed um a lot and it's it's quite exciting to see because i'm the type of person who doesn't like to sit still and be stagnant so so my path to an mvp in like from my perspective, has been mainly around helping the community on the tech forums, sharing my blogs out to the world, my view of what what things look like. Because, like you might write a blog about the exact same thing that I've wrote a blog about, but I've discovered something different because you know something happened or my setup was different to your setup. Um, well, you know, I would likely knows. write on the marketing or product marketing side True. of the topic. Yeah. So it might be very different. But yeah, I mean, that's, I always tell people that same thing. It's like, even if we had similar skill sets, we might be in different industries. We have different real world experience, customer examples, I mean, deployment experiences, problems that happen at different phases of things. So we'll have completely different perspectives. 
that's why I was encouraged. Like, so I, I remember having a conversation with somebody who's just like, you know, yeah, but this other person, they really kind of wrote the definitive blog post on that. I'm like, that's ridiculous. They're not you. They don't have your audience. They don't, they don't have the trust that you have with your audience to go and write that same thing. If anything, it, you know, if it is the, the, the ultimate uh, blog post yeah. on that, that topic, then reference them, point to it, talk about it, feedback on it, and then add your your two bits to the end of it. And, and, and I think, like, if, if there's a couple of things that I want to, you know, share with the audience today, it's being an MVP is nothing if it's not without the community. Mm. The, and that's, you know, the technology and ways of working is one thing, but the tech community is just awesome and it's 24 7 all you can eat it's it's no longer oh i need you know people down the road from me who know about the same technology that i can talk to it's across the world um i i find that due to time time zone differences in my work day that i actually talk a lot with the uk hmm. um technology community more than I do New Zealand, um, because by the time I'm working, they're working, and then by the time I finish working, the UK have, have woken up um, and started their day. So it, it is a, there is no, like the community is the core of, of what the, te you know, the technology can do stuff, but the community make it work and offer their, there and that's what I like about it so much is there is like Azure is really good because it can take a company that's operating locally and serving their own local clients to a global company within the you know simplistic sake a few clicks yeah and the community that's being developed around these technologies and it is the exact same and i just i love being a part of it and offering my view of what it looks like whether i'm an mvp or not it's it's a passion that that really drives me in the continuous learning and challenges because who wants to be stagnant right yeah um the the other thing that i would say so so my just to go back to your question, my my as part of my nominations to be an MVP, I had to write in like everything that I'd done over the past year, and I think there was a there was a good 180 items that I ended up adding because they were all helping out people on the tech community. Mm -hmm. There was blog articles, there was sharing stuff, um, there was editing Microsoft documentation. Like if I saw some, if I was reading something and I noticed that something wasn't quite right, I would go and open up a pull request on GitHub with my edits. All those things add up and you don't need to be a public speaker, you know, at a huge conference. That This is what I like about the award so much is there's so many different ways to contribute. Yeah. and earn the MVP award. Not everyone's the same. Not everyone, right. like I learn by reading blog articles more than I would uh, like a video because I'd get distracted. So that, and that, that aspect, it's, it's hard for some people to understand. It is a bit of a black box. Mm. There's no checklist of thing. Hey, if you do these 10 things, you become an MVP. It's very different. There are some people that are 100% forums. That's it. They never want to present. They haven't written any books. They have a, they're afraid to get in front of a camera, but they are, you know, just constantly on the forums and answering questions and adding value that way. There are others that write books. There are people that are, and we see all the people, all the names that are out there that you're familiar with that are regulars at conferences. I used yep. to do, uh, I, you know, two or three conferences a month. I did that for about a decade. And of course, this little pandemic thing happened and slowed that down, but it, it uh, made me kind of relook at and prioritize what I want to do. And so like, I have the ability to go and do things. I, I work for a company that supported and will pay for travel to most of these uh, events. But I just, I look at it and say, you know what, I'm, I'm doing other things that I'm, you know, that 
I'm satisfied with it, that I'm, I'm giving back to the community. I'm doing these things. And I'd rather do that than take all the time to travel. I miss friends. I miss getting out. Yep. I'll do events from time to time, but it's a mixture of those things. And of course, you know, we're getting ready for renewal. So everybody, every MVP around the world is mm. across. Did I do enough? Did I give back enough for that? Um, but it's a, but uh, it, that, there are a lot of different ways that you can give back. It doesn't have to be. So if you are fearful of getting up on a stage, you do not have to get up on a stage. There's no requirement to ever do that. Um, no, but, but I, I guess that's the thing. Like now I'm an MVP and like an award that I never thought I would get. There's so many opportunities for me to either continue with the way that I obviously was adding value to the community because I got the award in the first place. Um, or I could, you know, I'm, I'm quite excited because it's allowing me to step outside my comfort zone. Like this podcast, for example, a couple of years ago, I would never have had this chat with you. Um, I try to scare people away. That's, people. That, see, that's the thing. I, that's that first layer. I try to make people, you know, fearful of talking yep. to me. That's uh, my yep. goal. So, <laughs> but, and, and I think at the end of the day, and this is something that I've personally struggled with is back yourself. Um, you know, you look at all these articles and you look at the web website and it's that iceberg analogy. All you see is the stuff above the water. You don't see all the, all the failures that people have gone through, all the learnings. You don't see the nights that um, people have spent banging their head against the theoretical wall. Yeah. All you see is what the success looks like, all the light, um, the top of the iceberg. You know, it's, I look at people and I go, how, how am I an MVP in the same bucket of people as, you know, that person? Because they wrote a really awesome thing that, you know, automates X. Um, but everyone's quite individual and it's, you just don't know what, what is happening you know well that's you don't know that mm. that that's something too is that there because there are there are definitely mvps out there that i kind of you know put up on a pedestal or like that like yep. that then i got to know them <laughs> still like good good friends with but then but you realize hey everybody's human everybody has weaknesses they have their i used to always joke that like nobody knows everything from you know in the, as a sharepoint mvp nobody knows everything about sharepoint it's like ah, there's actually three or four people that i would argue do know everything about sharepoint yep. um but they're uh but they, they they have other flaws and other things around them and uh, again they're they're human and so um it's, I actually prefer it when MVPs show that kind of sensitive side, show, talk about failures as much as successes. I yep. think I learn as much or if not more from people's failures. It's not about the one time where I did something and it worked. It's here's the dozen times. Here's what I tried. Here's what I learned, why it didn't work and what, what was wrong with this approach. Yeah. Um, Sometimes that, 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 that kind of learning is even more valuable than, you know, this is how you do something. It's, and, and I think that's one of the things like going back to the tech community in general, it's, we're all at the end of the day, you know, we're almost quote unquote a family, but we're, well, friends that we can select, but it's, mm -hmm. It's a team of people. It's, yeah, I think we kind of mentioned the board collective last week, but um, yeah, it is, but without the assimilation. Yeah, without the, right, <laughs> yeah. It's, but, but it is, yeah. uh, my strength might be different to someone else's and, and there, you know, it's, it's, it's being an MVP or even just being someone in the tech community, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got an award or not, it's, you're part of a team. Yeah. Um, and even if you can't do something because some some reason, or you may not be looking at it the right way, or you might just need to run some, you know, you're struggling with something and you need to run through it with someone else. It's just, there's a plethora of people across the world who, will, who are eager to help you. And no doubt they may have problems with something else. It's a, yeah, it's definitely, a, um, it's just, a, we're all learning. Yeah. you know whether it's the same technology or different technology or you might be using 
um, Azure Web Apps to host one, one website, or you might be using, you know, VM scale sets to run the exact same website a different way. You know, it's just, and there's so many ways you can build those Lego, Lego blocks as well. It's just, it's exciting to, to be around and see. And so I think my path to MVP is mainly trying to give back to the community the best way I know how, which is helping out, helping people out on the forums, blogging, sharing, sharing stuff on my Twitter and LinkedIn, um, and just having the passion for the technology and yep. trying new things and trying to be as cutting edge as possible. Well, one thing I always like to, this is a great, well said, one thing I always throw out there, and I'm sure you'll agree, is that um, for those that are watching, listening, um, if you have questions, uh, and if you uh, have an MVP, you know, certainly, you know, Luke and myself that you follow, or, uh, you know, have questions for, don't be shy, reach out. These are some of the most friendly and uh, approachable people, which is one of the reasons it is a characteristic of mm. MVPs is how approachable we are. There are a couple that are cranky, <laughs> I will admit, but yeah, they're I still guess, approachable. Yeah. It just they're depends still... on pre-coffee for me, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Be aware of time zones uh, when yeah, you're reaching yeah. out as well, you know, yeah. but, but, uh, but you're right. It's kind of like if, if someone because I've had people message me about, oh, do you know the answer to this? And it's kind of like, oh, no, I don't. But, you know, let's find out. Let's right. try it. Or let's I know somebody something. who I know or, somebody who knows the answer to that. Or right. I know something. Yeah. And you, yeah. you pass them on. It's it's not as if I'm, you know, it's going, I'm here to help as much as anyone right. else. So exactly. You're right. Mm. Well, Luke, I really appreciate your time again for the re-record. I really appreciate the time. And uh uh, you know, for folks that want to find out more about you, get in touch. What are the best ways to reach you? Uh, you can look me up on Twitter, which is Luke Murray NZ. Um, so, or LinkedIn, which is LJ Murray. So that's L J M U R R A Y. Um, and then my Twitter handle is Luke L U K E M U R R A Y N Z. Um, but yeah, you can find me through any of those, and don't don't hesitate to and of course i'll out. have the links i'll have the links here within youtube and within the blog post as well as your your blog site as well so uh, luke well happy enjoy the rest of um of uh, uh build that's going on so and then we'll, yes, we'll thanks we'll connect soon hopefully see each other next year for the uh mvp summit it's the best part of being an mvp is that it's the best perk within the program yeah yeah i've already told my wife it's like uh just an FYI, I'm, you know, I've, I'm pre-booking and I'm saving for this trip. Um, I hope it does happen. It'll be a life dream to go to, to go to Redmond. But um, yeah, I was just like, I've already put in the feelers, the family of going, yeah. oh, by the way, <laughs> yeah. I'm t I might be taking a trip overseas. Very cool. Well, we'll see you soon. Cool. Thank you. Wow. Wow.